And the only other piece of housekeeping I'm going to say is that we, we run Talking Data Equity on Fridays at noon Toronto time. And we run them as a Zoom meeting, even though we are told this is an insane idea and that we should not do this and it's going to get filled with chaos and trolls. Uh, so far, we've had a lot of good luck. So what we're asking is that for the first part of Talking Data Equity, uh, you do keep yourself muted so that we can hear our special guest. And then in the live Q&A parts, if you want to ask a question, um, we're going to ask you to raise your hand using the reactions section in that Zoom menu bar and just raise your hand and we'll do our best to get to you in order. I can't promise it's going to be in order, but we'll do our best. <laughs> okay, so all that aside, um, I have been up since about 4.30 this morning because I've been so excited <laughs> about our special guest today. <laughs> um, and our special guest today is Dr. Marika Shomaris. And there are so many things that I could say. I could use our entire hour to tell you about the amazing work she does. But instead, I'm going to point you to the forum where you can read her biography and see a whole bunch of other things. Um, but I will say that she is the vice president of the Busara Center in Nairobi. And right now, I believe she's coming to us from Chicago, where she is a special lecturer at the Harris School of Public Policy. So on that note, I will turn it over to Dr. Shamaris. Who already falls at the first hurdle of trying to unmute herself. Um, thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me and for the very warm welcome and for being able to speak to this uh, truly intimidating group of people. So I'm, I'm gonna share my screen. So I have a couple of things that I want to talk to using slides and then um, show you a little bit about how I think about some of the things that I think you all deal with every single day, tell you some of the metaphors that I try to use to make the conversation on what data means and how we can turn it into evidence and how we need to be careful of it to make that conversation more real for people who might struggle with um, seeing the nuances. And then, yeah, I'd love to hear how some of this sounds to you and whether it resonates or whether this is all stuff that you already have thought about, which I would also love to hear. So um, I, I thought I'll call this the thorny business of evidence, inclusion, categories, satellites, and landscapes. And that's the order in which I'm going to talk through this, evidence, inclusion, categories, satellites, and landscapes. So let's get started. Let's start with this notion of evidence. So I know that this is the, the heart of what you do. And of course, it's a very interesting um, question to take a step back and always remind ourselves where our notions of evidence actually come from. And I want to posit that it's useful to every now and then remind us that evidence as we talk about it now, as it's, talk about, as it's, as it's talked about in the mainstream, isn't a given. It wasn't always imagined in the way that it is imagined now. So but it, you know, exactly what Heather said, this, this notion that quantitative data is something neutral and objective and factual is in the mainstream policymaking world so much taken for granted. But of course, we need to keep reminding ourselves that knowledge and understanding of knowledge and evidence is created in its time and in its discussions and in its intellectual traditions. And we just find ourselves in a moment of an intellectual tradition where this kind of streamlining, this notion that you can find an average that gives you the broad picture that includes somehow everyone, because it is the average in which that is a very, very powerful idea. But that's not where we started from. And it's very useful, I think, to go back sometimes to what Mary Poovey in her wonderful book of the same name calls the history of the modern fact. Because the mystery of the, the history of the modern fact, maybe the mystery too, actually, but the history of the modern fact is that at some point, there was a split and that at some point what was before understood to be connected to see kind of data and interpretation as knowledge that couldn't be separated so so there was always an interpreter and hence it couldn't ever be fully neutral because there was somebody who would look at information at some point that was split and what you see here on the image i hope you still see that right do you still see the seal a very yeah fantastic um so what you see here is the seal of the uh, UK Royal Statistical Society, which was founded in 1834. And what the very um, poorly readable uh, motto of the society says 
is that it's to be threshed out by others. And this kind of really marks the moment in time when all of a sudden there was this notion that was developed that you could have a data gatherer, which is essentially kind of a, a handy person who can pluck data and then hand it over to someone else who can thresh it out, who can fill it with the meaning, and that these two processes can be completely disconnected because one is so neutral. It's like painting a wall white, the wall will be white, and it's inevitable that the interpreter who then comes to look at the wall will, will only see that this is a white wall. And so the at that point in time, this split occurred, that the notion that actually data collection was a specific task, a specific skill even, and that interpretation was also a specific skill. But that's not what it was always like. Statistics, this idea that you have this neutral body of information that could then be used by anyone and the result of the interpretation would always be the same, that didn't always have the upper hand. Um, and at this point in time, it was then established that the systematic knowledge comes from political economists or for politicians um, who then are able to fill this with me. So what that tells us, me, is that really this notion of the fact, right, that of this inevitable truth that comes with a certain type of data, that that really is a, an invention and it's part of the intellectual tradition in which we operate. And I want to take that back one more step, again, building on Mary Pruvy's book and ask, well, but where does this notion come from? That, you know, if we take seriously the idea that the fact is an invention, how was it invented? And the wonderful point that she makes is that it was born out of the idea of double entry bookkeeping. So I went to Wall Street Mojo to give you a nice uh, image of double entry bookkeeping. But what that means is that she, she says at some point, people started checking a fact against itself by just replicating the process that they went through. So double entry bookkeeping, I don't know if there's any hobby accountants in the room, but essentially it just means that you record income and outcome twice, right? And you make sure that your balance sheet shows the same number. And so you check the logic of your own fact on itself. That's what double entry bookkeeping is. And that is what the imagination of the modern fact as we think about it now, um, what fueled it, what, what gave birth to it. What's interesting about this is of course that double entry bookkeeping can be beautiful and is often manipulated, it can look like a wonderful, beautiful balance sheet because all it does is check itself against its own inner logic. If I put 17 outgoing, 17 ingoing, it gives me a wonderful clean balance sheet. It doesn't tell me whether 17 was right in the first place. And so that to me is a very, very useful image to keep in mind that we are looking very often at data as confirming its own internal logic and very rarely take the step away to say, but is the 17 right? Because of course, we, we know that the 17 can be manipulated in many, many different ways, right? The 17 might have been collected in very questionable ways. Someone might have just made up the 17, but once it lands in the double entry bookkeeping, that um, becomes a fact that then in its own logic is proven. And it's important to keep this in mind for everything else that I'm going to say that, of course, each fact in its representation like this is a human creation. And we know this from applying cognitive frameworks. And we know this by rooting things into intellectual traditions and understanding where things sit in political discourse and why we understand that the results agenda has made the emphasis on quantitative data where you can prove results by counting them um, very, very strong. So each fact has a social element to it, even the hardest quantitative data and the memory of the double entry bookkeeping reminds us of this. And this is also true that each fact is a created element for where the roots of international development research lie. And I just wanted to do a little bit of a detour at that because that's equally important because this is where we go into the equally thorny history of qualitative research. So I've given you two pictures here. One on, on the left is a very famous British anthropologist, Evans Pritchard, who wrote some of the seminal work on classic anthropology about witchcraft among the Zande and about the Nuer and South Sudan and so on. And Evans Pritchard these days, as are many anthropologists of that era, are often imagined as the people who finally recorded you know, the deep tribal rituals and cultures and were able to convey this knowledge to the rest of the world. The anthropology at that time had a real kind of adventurer element to it. 
And that is very much a goldifying, <laughs> is that a work that sounds good? Well, that's a golden version of the history of what happened. Because of course, what really happened, particularly with Evans Pritchard, but with others, were two things. One, Evans Pritchard went into the Sudan as it was at the time with a very, very clear mandate, which is seek for something governable. The British Empire sent him and said, find something about these people that allows us to govern them. So in the Zande Kingdom, he found witchcraft and the Zande King, very recognizable for British administrators who were often very puzzled when they encountered what they considered to be a tribe and there wasn't a leader, which is quite common in a lot of South Sudanese societies. So he thought for this something governable, witchcraft, fantastic way of governing people, right? Using fear is a lovely tool of governments all over the world. And he, the other big part of his mandate was to find ways to pacify people. So he then created these anthropological stories that came, became very much the history of the people as they were perceived in the largely Western world, because of course these histories and descriptions didn't exist in written form, but they became sort of the truth. But it really was the truth as understood through the eyes of Evans Pritchard, who looked at them as subject of the British empire, maybe objects even, who needed to be governed, who needed to be pacified, and who needed to be exoticized to maintain the superiority of the British Empire. And a, the, another scholar, a Maori scholar, wrote a fantastic book on, on the, the history of research with um, indigenous people in her case. And she makes this point, which is why I give you the second image there of the mass in a museum, that the history of development research is of course deeply rooted in this idea of bringing betterment to people, but not so much betterment that they then you know, challenge the, st the structures of power, but really one way of, of doing this and making sure that superiority of the empire was maintained without giving people too many skills so that they could start challenging the empire was to bring complete disorder to colonize people and disconnecting them from their own histories and their languages and their social relations and their wholeness. And she makes a wonderful point to say, if you look at how international development research started, it was really by picking people apart by categorizing every single part of them. If you go into a museum and you ask, where can I find indigenous people? You can find bones in one department. You can find masks of completely different phases of life or rituals or celebrations in another department. You can maybe find languages in another department. You can find religion in another department. So it's a really, you can see unfold how people's, the categorization has picked them apart and this fragmentation was also a way to absolutely maintain rule over people. So fragmenting people is really a very powerful tool to make sure that they can't be whole. And it's not as postmodernist as we might claim. It's a really, it's a really, really old tool of research that was conducted in the name of advancement. And that is something that I think we need to keep in mind whenever we look at data for international development. It was very much a way of making sure that there was the category of the native and the native was best understood through the eyes of the person who was coming to the natives and picking them apart in different categories. This becomes important when I talk about categories. So I want to talk you through a very quick exercise. I want to ask you to play with me for a quick, very quick exercise. And I want you to draft an inclusive dinner party with a purpose. You want to find something out in this dinner party and you want it to be inclusive. This purpose of this dinner party is that you want to know whether hair color influences if people like spicy food or not. So you're kind of obviously looking to sample people that will allow you to draw some of these conclusions in the very good intellectual tradition in which we sit at the moment, which is let's find direct causality, right? Causality is such an important concept. So you can have five guests for your dinner party that is supposed to find out whether hair color influences people like spicy food or not. I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about who might be on your guest list. And maybe after I'll finish my few thoughts and then maybe afterwards we can, we can pick it up again, but I'll be quiet for a few seconds to let you think. Oh, and I prepared a beautiful picture to inspire you. I forgot. 
so I wonder actually, no, if, if there, is there a brave soul who might want to um, offer up who they would invite for their higher color spicy food dinner party with a purpose? If you're willing to offer it up, you can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. No, fair enough. Um, I dumped this on you, but I'm sure all of you went through some of these processes, right? Why am I making the choices that I'm making? What am I assuming here about people? And what am I prioritizing about them? Am I prioritizing their hair color? Am I prioritizing my assumption of whether or not they like spicy food? Why are you prioritizing this? Because one is very visible. So it's very easy to say, let's just go by hair color and then we can see who uh, might like spicy food or not. And what information will your choices give you? It's very unclear whether the most important thing that people feel about their hair color is that it influences their food preferences. What will we lose if we simply think of the question of hair color and spicy food by asking five people with different hair colors for their preferences. And what do we not know? This is a very um, kind of useful exercise to think through, to always keep in mind when you ask yourself, what, what am I looking at? Where am I turning my gaze? But also what categories am I inventing? Am I inventing the category here that puts everyone who happens to have one particular hair color in one basket with the purpose of getting one particular piece of information validated? And that, of course, takes us to the invention of categories. I've already made the point that in the history of international development research, categories, invention of categories, played a huge part. Like the native was categorized in so many ways to give it, give everyone a language, like the empire, a language to speak about them. And you're all very familiar with these, right? A very prominent example of the invention of categories is, of course, the invention of the category of refugee and internal person which was invented as an organizational tool, right? To figure out well, how to deal with the fact that people were chased out of their houses. It probably mattered very little to the people being chased away, whether or not they managed to cross the state border or not. It mattered a lot for international responses because of course, the question of IDP happens within international, uh, within international borders, national borders, sorry, and puts the, supposedly the protection duty on the government, but of course that the whole point of the IDP is often that a government doesn't protect. So that created a different operational structure than refugees did who had crossed an international border and thus care of duty had been changed. But this was very much an operational category that was invented to allow in some way or another, in, you know, in a well-meaning way to exert some power over people and how people would be administered. And this invention of categories, I think, haunts us to this day when we look at the relationship between data, oops, I went backwards, between data and evidence and then operationalize this into policy. And so where does this leave us? And this is where I take you uh, surprisingly into satellites and landscapes, because I think when, when I think of a satellite image, this is how I think about this, the satellite image gives you the very bold lines of maybe identity, but I find it very striking that we often use the words identity and category in the same way. Identity for me is a very nuanced, changeable internal process that also has, you know, on Monday might have different things in the foreground than on Tuesday. Category is the operational use of identity to allow aid agencies to do the work that they need to do. So the categories become very, very broad brushed. Really what you see on the satellite image, gender, very popular, age, very popular you know, maybe national background, education, and so on. But this is where the satellite image really shows us just a very, very broad, big identity. That's kind of the hair color that you had in your dinner party. And when you zoom into that satellite image, then you might get more to identity. And that's when it gets very complicated for international agency, because then you see how neighborhoods can change. And you can look into people's windows and you see who sits around the dinner table and who gets to eat and what the houses look like. And in many ways, one of the big dilemmas that we have with data is that I think the data we use for operational decisions is kind of satellite image level and really disregards the neighborhood. But what can we do with this dilemma? And to answer that question for myself, I thought I need to go to the experts. And so 
when in doubt, ask astronauts. They know things about satellite images. And so what NASA would tell you about how you can actually get a lot of really detailed information from a satellite image is to look for scale and look for patterns and shapes and textures and define colors. And so one other point that they make is that very often people look at a satellite image and they try to immediately look at familiarity. They try to find something that they can recognize. And we are all guilty of this. If you look at a area shot of your neighborhood, you will look for your house, right? You want to see where your house is. It's my house. So you zoom in immediately on what you know. And this is exactly what happens with these identity categories. People immediately zoom in and say, well, we, we understand women. So clearly we need to have gender. But that's the biggest lesson I think we can have from keeping the settlement image in mind to say, don't, don't go for familiarity, take a step back and allow yourself to look at patterns and see how maybe the patterns of the landscape have changed. So that all of a sudden might open up the question to say, okay, I can see the bold lines of women, but is women the most important part for someone's identity? Female headed household is a very, very famous vulnerable category. And a lot of women get grouped into this vulnerable category of female-headed household, but it might not be at all the most important thing for them that they happen to be a woman and that they're running the household. They might have a very, very different set of circumstances that they're grappling with, and yet all aid, all kind of evidence-based aid that comes their way is very focused on the notion of vulnerability and female-headed. So they might end up with a lot of non-food items for support, where really they might need legal support to fight a case in court. But it's never imagined in this broad brushed identity of female headed household that actually they're battling a, a land case in court or something like that. So for me, the satellite image is a really, really useful reminder that it's important to go to dive down into the neighborhood and to seek to understand identity without the certainty of category. And what could that, how, how that could that help us with trying to look at quantitative data in a more nuanced way or create, you know, creating a more nuanced discussion around this. And the other way I think about this is something that I call the mental landscape. So the mental landscape for me is a kind of catch all image that allows us to understand that while people have communal experiences and communally shared um, identities, individually, every single person will have their own mental landscapes, which really brings together many, many elements of who, who they are. It's the, the mundane experiences of everyday life, things that they find easy or joyful or very hard. It's perceptions. We all know how powerful perceptions are. Perceptions are really not perceptions. They are people's reality. It is particularly in people who have experienced violence or marginalization, a sense of loss and injustice and neglect that might have been going on over generations. And that shapes every single interaction that they have throughout the day. It's expectations and disappointments that they've gone through many times, including from international development programs who come in often present a huge promise based on the identity that the program has identified and says, you as a teenage girl, we will now empower you so that you no longer will get pregnant. Of course, what happens in that interaction is that it's assumed by this kind of category-based intervention that the teenage girl has the power to make that decision to completely own her body and not get pregnant, which is a very unrealistic assumption in the context in which she might live. And this, to me, creates a real dilemma in how this categorization and data and then what's expected of people intermingles because many, many of these programs that are designed on a very unnuanced categorical view of people really expect people to be somewhat superhuman because they expect them to, first of all, be very strong in the category that has been identified, teenage girl, and then be super strong to be able to step out of that category and overcome all the power relationships that that brings. And then if they don't manage to do this, then inevitably there's kind of a disappointment and this, this very contradictory, messy message that's being sent. All of this, I think, rooted in the very broad brush categorizations that we see. And so for me, this idea of the mental landscape and the many layers of complexities of the piece of gospel is a much better way to think through identity. It's much better than the, the broad categorical view that we often take. Um, it's very hard to do because it does require a lot of very localized engagement, but I would argue that that kind of engagement is also the only way to go against broad brush, broad brush, big ideas of big data. And so I want to close um, 
like kind of taking a, a, a loop back in a way to this notion of where are we in the intellectual tradition at the moment that imagines evidence in a very particular way, in a kind of double entry bookkeeping way, and also that imagines impact in a very particular way, right? Impact, policy impact at the moment is so often, I mean, the word says it all, right? Impact was the meteor strike that hits once, and it's not, it's not imagined, it doesn't convey in its language this slow ripple of progress and change which for me is where one of the maybe most striking cognitive dissonances of how the impact of quantitative data is imagined comes in. Because while we know that quantitative data it does get quoted in policy documents and it's very often the kind of hit it all argument in a conversation, we can also look, if we look at the story of impact and change, we see qualitative moments as the moment of galvanizing action. And we see that actually very often, and I've just picked some examples here that you will all be familiar with. On all the issues that you see here, plenty of evidence existed, plenty of quantitative data existed. There was no shortage of data on police brutality in the US, but they didn't achieve impact until there was a qualitative and emotional a galvanizing moment when all of a sudden that evidence took on a different meaning because something else happened. And it is in this something else, in this conversation between data and the qualitative, the emotional experience of what else happens, the galvanizing often tragic moment that then something can shift. And so that to me is where this very useful conversation needs to continue between what does quantitative data tell us? How do we imagine impact? And when does it actually become evidence that galvanizes something. And the answer I, that I think I would stand by this will always be, it never happens alone. But with that, I close. I, would, I wanted to, well, I'll leave you my email address at the end. But yes, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much, Marika. I really, really appreciate it. You can all see now why I have been up for hours being so excited because- I'm so, so sorry so much. about that, by the way. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> no, no problem. Um, and uh, I, I have questions that could definitely fill the next half hour of things I want to talk about. Uh, and you could, uh, but what I'm going to do is open it up now to uh, people who are here that have, that want to put a question into the chat. You can either, um, if you have a question that you want to share with everyone, you can put it into the chat using um, the drop down menu to everyone. If you don't feel comfortable asking a question uh, attached to your name, you can direct message me in the Zoom chat and I'll ask the question for you. And we also have a few people who have put questions in um, prior to um, today. So while you all think about that, I, I'm gonna start with, um, actually, I'm gonna start with one of my questions. <laughs> And that is, I'm so, I'm so excited to hear you talk about female headed households, because that was actually one of the very first pieces of work that we all count did um, was we, we took some data sets, a, a single data set, and we analyzed it um, through like, I think it was six different definitions of what gets to count as a female headed household and saw how differently who got aid and who didn't get aid would be based on who got to define what accounts. And then we re-ran an impact analysis to see like, did the program work? And it was entirely dependent on who got to set up that definition of female headed household. So um, we, I really love your idea of talking about two different things, categories and identities. I hadn't heard it expressed that way until I started watching your YouTube videos. <laughs> and, um, I think that it can help us really have some of the practical conversations that the We All Count community has because we are often trying to figure out how to handle that. That, um, you know, if we divide people in our data sets into very nuanced multiple identities, what ends up happening is we often double down on stereotypes, we deepen divisions, and we end up producing research that goes against exactly what we're trying to do. Um, however, most of us work in a policy environment or a legislative environment that requires us to use certain categories. Um, it, you know, none of us have successfully gotten any of the big international development folks to stop distributing aid along that line of, of female-headed households. Um, 
do you have <laughs> any suggestions on um, ways to move the needle on on what gets to count between this idea of, of categories and identities, um, either at like the big level, like the UN level, the USAID level, or even at the local level, if somebody's working for like a, you know, a local health unit giving out vaccines. Um, do you have any idea about how to have these conversations with somebody that's really different than yourself, who might just be you know, managing the budget? of the local health agency and doesn't want to have a nuanced conversation about categories and um, identity the way that we do. Yeah, it's a huge problem, right? And for me, I want, it's actually, it's really kind of baffling to me. When I was writing this up, this difference between identity and category, I kept worrying that I, that I had missed a big scholarly discourse because I thought, I don't really understand why we talk about identity politics because it's not identity politics, it's category politics. There was one scholar in the, 90s who i think an australian um with an italian name who wrote made this point right um and i my, her name escapes me right now but i find that really baffling because it now becomes completely clear to me that it is about categorization and of course also with it when you look at the history of this right that categorization was about governing people this is no different categorization is about imposing some sort of aid governance on people and so then what to do with this so there's a couple of things i think that are useful first of all starting to use that language is more honest, right? Transparency is always very useful to say, do we need to actually spend a little bit of time to ask the people that we've identified for this category, whether that is an important part of their identity? Because the, the research question that I would always ask them is, through what mechanism do I assume that a female headed household, that the most important part for the women in that term is that they're female and that they're heading a household? And that already might, that might, that's already moving the needle a huge way, right? Because that's hardly ever asked. And in this long, tricky relationship between recipients and aid intervention, at some point also recipients really take their battles and who could blame them, right? And it's like, well, I, I can no longer explain this to you. But that to me is a really, really important way to get back to saying, well, through what mechanism do we assume that the category that we're applying is the most useful one? And are there others that sits in a discourse that is emerging, right? So it's not maybe that alien. You can couch that in the terminology of the localization discourse. It certainly fits really well with ownership language, right? To say for something to, we know that for something to be effective, people need to feel that they own it. And if it's just an imposed category that kind of where they go, okay, I'll take another piece of soap and wash base. And even though I've got plenty, then you know, that's not very helpful. So there are, current discourses that allow that. The other really interesting thing I have, uh, I encountered was in a research program that I, I worked on um, for a long time, where we found that identity-based delivery of services, so basically targeting specific groups to be able to receive a service, specific groups that are considered marginalized, can actually have two very different effects. And it's not always use it's not always experienced by that group as a positive experience and very often even improved service delivery so when people measurably have better access to healthcare, they don't find that a positive experience and we were so puzzled by this right because we just thought that surely the priority must always be to receive healthcare. but the reason why it's not a positive experience per se is because people either then realize that they are given the service of because of who they are and they might feel that that's not quite the right way that they've experienced this, or they might feel that actually what the service delivers doesn't make up for all the injustices of the past. So if you have a long history of marginalization, one health service isn't going to rectify this, but, and maybe more counterintuitively, it's also often that they think, well, we're giving this service despite of who we are. It's kind of, based on some external pressure that is built on, okay, look, we are, we're even delivering services to the most marginalized people. And so it becomes an act of charity. It becomes in the actual experience of receiving the service often very condescending, very negative, which then points us again to this very toxic notion of grouping people into categories to receive something. So for a programmatic approach, that could really mean that you need to phrase what you're offering in very different ways to not alienate people. We saw this as well with 
framing programs as post-conflict recovery programs, where people then assumed this identity of a post-conflict identity, which was very, very unhelpful. So all of these are ways to nuance this conversation to say, no, you know, I know you think in big numbers and you think in key performance indicators and causality and impact, but your impact is going to suffer, even in a way, even if you stay in your own logic, if you don't take into consideration how some of this lands and that requires this nuance of work. But I don't want to pretend that I find these conversations easy, nor that I have a secret lexicon that I could deliver on them. <laughs> that is a great answer. That really helps uh, me think through some of the tricky issues. And I really like how you make suggestions that don't involve asking people to change their minds. You know, you, you know, you said you can stay in your logic and here's why this is a bad idea in your logic. <laughs> I mean, I have a whole bunch of other reasons that this is a bad idea. Um, but e even if we're not going to change your mind, here is why this isn't going to help you reach your goal. Uh, I really, really love that. Um, we have a couple of questions that are coming in by private chat. Oh, somebody has their hand raised. I'm going to do that actually first so that you get to hear someone else talk. It's not me. Uh, okay, so uh, go ahead. Uh, pers you go ahead and talk. Yeah, hello. I'm just gonna unmute myself and I know we're recording. Um, so my name is Mish and thank you so much for talking about um, mapping. Uh, so my background is demography, um, anthropology and um, epidemiology. So I study the social epidemiology of violence and um, in a construct of, uh, you called it categorization, uh, racialization falls under categorization. So I'm gonna stick with categorization because it's a little bit less inflammatory. Um, what I uh, was thinking about um, when you were talking, I often use maps to try and explain, because um, there's a gap often between those that work under me that are, wanting to do predictive analytics or just very much in the we want a methodology and then there is community that is more about we are looking for solutions and so one of the things um, that I do uh, is use the map but I use the map I kind of go this step further and one of the reasons I do it is because of the uh, is because of what you brought up is that the recipients, um, there, it, it makes an imbalance over time when there is this sense of I'm giving something to you because you have a need and it brings kind of shame, um, but it also is guilt on the giver. So it, it brings this tension and I think that it further stratifies what's already um, broken. And so what I like to do is actually map lots of overlaying data, administrative and public data and what community is willing to share. And I don't allow my analysts to choose a methodology. I had this great woman, she actually presented at the National Institutes of Health yesterday about some work that's being done globally um, around, and she's a demographer also. Um, but, um, and she said, because once you start with a methodology, you've already introduced bias. And we try and just look at what we see on the map. And the reason that I do that is because when we talk about categorization or racialization um, or genderization, just all of the things that fall under that, um, people get in their minds kind of like when you ask the dinner question. <laughs> and it's very hard for them to pull away from that. And so what I encourage is for everyone to understand that something that we do here has a ripple effect globally. And if we map it, we see that we actually are all connected. We think we're not, but we really are. And so that's kind of how I have that conversation because just like we might look for our house in the map, we can look what are some of the structures, what are some things we see, kind of what's going on on the map. And then people are more focused on areas where we might find overlapping data that's very dense that we maybe hadn't expected to find. And they're less concerned about the category and they're more concerned about what are we seeing. And so that's kind of how I approach it um, because it, I have very delicate conversations. I do work um, for the government. So I have to work with a lot, you know, we oversee 300 state agencies. And so um, 
we have to be very careful uh, to not offend, but we also have to talk about how do we get data justice and data solidarity and data equity and what might that look like? And so this is kind of a really good way. So I think I'm gonna use your categorization term, if that's okay with you, um, because I like, I, I often talk about, we have to think, when we think inclusivity, we have to think uh, beyond kind of what we're used to thinking. And so I think your categorization is a really good way. So anyways, I just wanted to give an example of how I use, um, how I have those conversations when it's kind of difficult, but also to thank you for um, sharing um, about something I'm really excited about. So, oh, thank you. That sounds fantastic because I think I, I work a lot with visual imagery. Sadly, I don't have the skills to draw maps, um, but I, the visual imagery really helps me, right? And so I'm sure that the overlaying and showing complexities in this way, I mean, in a way that's again, again the, what a satellite picture does, right? It shows like one texture, but if you know, if you understand how to interpret it, you know that what you're looking at is bare soil, but soil where once the forest stood that had burned down, right? But if you are not an expert, if you don't take the time to interpret it in this way, then all you see is bare earth and it looks exactly the same as the soil next to it where a house has just been turned down and um, torn down. So these kind of nuances and overlaying the, the textures, I think is really, um, is, is a really fantastic way of looking at this. Um, the, I mean, the other thing about the, the categorization part is so interesting because I think it also moves our conversation on inclusion into the also less articulated and less comfortable space. Inclusion is always imagined as this un, you know, unequivocally positive thing, right? It sounds like a great term, but of course it's decision-making. You can only include if you also make decisions on who to exclude. That's how it should be. That's the whole point. And unless we get the categories, move away from them, we will exclude and include on such broad terms that it becomes almost meaningless, right? Then we will, we will include on hair color if we want to know about spicy food, right? So that to me is also a, a really interesting part of this conversation. Make, maybe we need to, that as a counterfactual to say, well, who do you want to exclude? When that might also help with understanding the female headed household, right? In that category, are there women that you would want to exclude because they might not fit your vulnerability criteria? Vulnerability is a problem, problematic term to put on someone as well, right? As you also said, but there's all these nuances where I think the, the conversation could be nuanced. And sorry, just Heather, I just saw one of the uh, responses in the chat from the, um, the dinner party questions, which are fantastic. Oh, it was from you actually, Heather. Anyone consider inviting only people who are experts on hair color or spicy food? I mean, honestly, would you, what would you rather do than go to that dinner party? Like almost anything else, like even do my tax return. <laughs> but what a great way to think about this. We would often do that, right? Very often that's exactly what would happen. Yeah, exactly. Like, well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, we won't invite any any people who might have hair or or like spicy food, but we'll we'll gather yeah. the five most renowned, most decorated experts, and we'll have a deep conversation about it, and then we'll write a policy. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm gonna put another question in in the chat um, because I think that this this is a question that was direct message to me, but I think that if everyone can read it, it's a long question. Um, in the US, inequities have policy and political underpinnings and demand systemic change at the policy level. Am I wrong in thinking that systemic discrimination occurs at the category level? What an interesting question. Whether an individual identifies as Black or not, if their skin has pigment, they are likely to experience racism and discrimination. How can we gather data to inform and influence policy without reducing data to categories? I love this question. This is not I mean, my I question. I just right. So I mean, I would argue very, I would argue very strongly that discrimination absolutely occurs at the category level, because I would argue that even people who experience their own identity as perceived by the outside world very strongly against one particular part of their identity, but we also know, like we know that we cannot. As much as we cannot talk about the experience of women, we also can't talk about the experience of black women. And we you know it, all of this becomes so quickly much more nuanced. So I think in, in some ways, yes, the discrimination occurs at the category level, but the 
the kind of abuse of identity also happens elsewhere because it, there's a wonderful um, German Turkish writer who makes this point in her work. And she says, you know, privilege, the definition of privilege is really that you don't need to be categorized, right? That's the whole point. If you are part of the mainstream, if you are included already, your category will not be denoted as being included. And I think that's a very, very beautiful way of, and you, like powerful, true way of thinking about this, right? And so the moment that naming occurs, not being named, not being described, that is part of privilege. And so the moment that naming occurs, something gets singled out, right? Again, sometimes maybe for benevolent or well-meaning reasons, but that to me is the naming part is really, really important. And that becomes much more complicated when then the naming goes into identities that are getting very nuanced, where people experience their own intersectionality and their own mental landscape. I really like Taylor's um, the way I've never thought about this, that identity can be quickly assumed by others and you know, it does and it's changeable and so on, but it's much, much harder or impossible to really delve into someone's mental landscape. Taylor's and my mental landscape, even if tomorrow we became roommates and started living together, wouldn't be the same, right? It would be very, very hard for us to, to align on this level. So that to me is another important point. But the moment you start naming, the naming always happens for a purpose. That is the roots of international development research, but that's also the root of, of discrimination. Absolutely. This um, people are begging in the chat for the resources, and and I will tell you that um, if you whoops no, <laughs> I was going to put something in chat. We will have um, all of the resources that we can get our hands on, and and we'll follow up um, with Marika for some links to some of the authors and things that she's talking about. But in in our data equity forum, which is public. Um, isn't harvesting your data, isn't serving you ads, uh, you'll be able to find the video for this as well as all the links we can get our hands on because I know that resources are just flying by and you want to grab them. I promise we'll get as many as we can in there. Um, yeah, and I have written this up and I'm only saying this, it's coming out in December. So there's a little bit of time. So the reason why I'm saying this is because it's coming up out in an open access book. So I'm much more comfortable to promote it because you can download it for free. So it'll come out in a book uh, that I've written in December, but um, I, and yeah, I promote it because it's not gonna cost you anything. And because I would just want to stress that it was so hard for me to write this book. It was truly painful to wrap my head around all these things. I find these issues so difficult that I can share my pain with you and say, <laughs> You know, I can I can give it to you for free, which is very nice. Um, so yeah, it's coming up in December. Fabulous! It will it will be a hot commodity here for sure, and uh, I'll make sure that everybody has access to that. And we'll probably ask you back <laughs> to be part of your virtual book tour. Um, I have another uh, direct message question, which is: Do you think it's po even possible or advisable? to try and collect data about someone's mental landscape. For example, sometimes instead of asking for race, we sometimes use uh, an index that measures a ex person's experience of racism. And that's something that we talk a lot about, we kind of struggle with. Um, but we've run into feedback as we're doing this mm -hmm. from the community that by asking about somebody's experience of racism, it feels like we're making it about them. And racism is an individual, racism is structural. Um, what do you think? Oh, how interesting. And what an interesting way to ask a question about race. So I would I would say this is a very good example of the, the way I imagine the mental landscape is it's always a con con collection of your communal and your individual experience. And so for me, racism isn't something that is either or, it's not either structural or individual, it is both, right? Because you are, by nature of racism, you are catapulted into a category by the system, but at the same time, your individual experience of that could be very, very personalized. And so for me, that dichotomy is not, is not so strict. Um, so maybe there's a way when you ask that question to kind of do almost do two things. I really like the idea of asking someone 
about the experience of racism and that I think will tell you a lot about not just the experience of racism, but about race. But is there another question that could look more at the structural thing? I mean, the way we, we would then do that in kind of survey research, it's easier to do it in qualitative research, would be maybe possibly through vignettes or something like that, right? Where you ask them to speculate on what some of the structural, like give a story of this person tried to access these particular government resources or whatever, some vignette that then allows people to extrapolate their own experience of racism into a broader structural level without directly analyzing and kind of becoming an expert on the broad landscape, which is the other thing that is so problematic, right? That then you always put on people that they're experts on all the structures that influence them, which is very, very unfair. But to me, that sounds like a very useful way of saying, we are not looking at the category, but we're looking at the impact of a category. So I I don't feel that uncomfortable with that, with that, that somehow, disguises that this is also a structural problem. But I would be curious to hear what, what others think about that. I would too. We have time for one more question. And I have a question that's been submitted in advance that I'm gonna use unless somebody wants to raise their hand. <laughs> this is your last 30 seconds, so raise your hand. All right. The question, this question was submitted beforehand, and this question is from um, a gender-based violence researcher. And there's a lot of them that, that kind of work in the We All Count community, but most of them uh, live in time zones that are not good for noon Toronto time. Um, and so their question is, we, we try and understand whether we are making a difference, whether our initiatives are making a difference, in improving gender-based violence in the local communities that we work. One of the problems that we're running into is that there are many different ways to define whether a person's experienced gender-based violence. Uh, there are, there's like the official survey questions that we're supposed to ask, um, but we feel that often these are applying a, a Western false empowerment vision of violence um, onto women that don't necessarily need us telling them about their experiences. However, my bosses are very unwelcoming to the idea about asking them about their experiences because they don't think enough of them will respond reliably. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> we can't trust you to know whether you've experienced violence. So we, we're going to make a, a, a couple of questions. Um, have you had any experience or know even the first question to ask when trying to work in a policy environment that's trying to measure change around violence of its initiatives without applying a Western corporate version of the definition of violence? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we grappled with that a lot. <clears throat> so there's, and we continue to grapple and there's many ways to think about this. One way to think about that, again, in this long-term research project that we did in conflict affected areas and notably also the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which of course when the debate on rape as a weapon of war became very violent was kind of at the center of this with very damaging effects. Um, so there's several findings that we have from that. One is, First of all, the notion of gender-based violence is very complicated in that it's in its language leaves out perpetrators, right? It is, it puts the reason on the person who holds that particular gender. So that to me is already a really, really um, interesting way to think a different way into this. Is it possible to actually ask women and I mean I do this, I'm doing this off the cuff. This is not how I would ask it, but rather than saying, have you experienced, ask what are, what and who, and it, does, it can be what, right? It might not always be who, but there's a lot of structural violence that women experience much more acutely than men has exerted violence on you. So actually shifting it to the perpetrator, which in many ways I would argue that's where attention needs to be anyway, right? It's, we, again, we put a lot of analytical weight on, uh, on the women to tell us their experience. And it's not that dissimilar from 
the teenage girls who are told to be empowered and not get pregnant, but actually have very, very little room to maneuver in the structures in which they sit. So that to me would be an interesting starting point. The other way, again, we do this, of course, is through vignettes or indirect questions, right? And when often when we ask about violence, um, it's very much what have other people around you experienced? So that, and we know, I mean, there's a lot of research done on this that people, of course, answer for their own experience, but it creates a very, very different um, interaction with people. But a main finding for us in very conflict affected situations was that gender based violence was part of violence that women were exposed to. Conflict related to gender based violence was not the biggest part of gender based violence. Of course, domestic violence is intimate partner violence is much um, stronger. But that the broader structural elements that kept continuing this were more prominent for women in how they experienced this. And there's some, you know, there's something I'm I'm not that deep into this. There's a lot of very nuanced work in what then happens with the identity of someone who's being abused and you know, how they then make sense of it, because we all we can never stop ourselves making sense of it. So that that's the, the kind of nuance that I think has been missing a bit. Um, this, weirdly disappearing perpetrator when uh, sentences that are always written saying women and girls are exposed to a lot of gender-based violence and you think well because they go out to sunbathe like who are the perpetrators and this this notion that of course it doesn't what happens to people who have suffered abuse is very profoundly changing the way they make sense of the world and will influence how they how they um, talk about it that is a really, really helpful answer. And I, I really think that so much of our, our work with data could be transformed if, if we were willing to frame it around um, what, what power dynamic is actually creating this. <laughs> like the, whether or not it's a category or identity, it, those are rarely creating the situation that we're trying to improve. <laughs> um, but it's much easier to kind of put the onus to change uh, further down on power structures than further up. Okay, I can't believe this hour is over. We will absolutely be having you back. Um, Dr. Shamaris, I can't say thank you enough. Um, you have put your email into, into the chat, which is very generous. You will definitely be getting emails. And uh, I might point you to my colleagues, but it's an important conversation. <laughs> we'll keep it going. <laughs> well, I really appreciate it. And, and we'll definitely be following up. And um, you all will be able to find uh, the recording of this if you want to share it or rewatch it, along with uh, as many of the resources that we talked about that we can get our hands on and have a fantastic rest of your day. Bye, Thank everyone. you so much for having me and for spending your Friday with me. Bye. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs>